<laughs> Not good. Uh, all right, so I'm Jared Simpson. I'm a group leader here at OICR. Um, I'm just over in West Tower. Um, I work primarily in De Novo Assembly. So since about 2007, I've been working in bioinformatics. And um, my, my research has always been not designed towards making assembly more scalable and faster and more memory efficient. And um, that's really what I'm going to talk about today. So there's really two key parts of my talk. One is a theoretical part and one's a practical part. Um, at the beginning, I'll talk about um, more the theory of assembly and how we use assembly graphs to represent sequencing data and the relationship between sequence reads. Um, and then I'll start going into more of the practical aspect of assembly. So I'll walk through um, what an assembly pipeline looks like step by step and give examples of programs like that can perform quality trimming and error correction of sequencing data. And then finally, um, I'll continue on the practical aspect of the talk and um, discuss various factors of what makes assembly a difficult problem. Why uh, do so many assembly projects fail or run into difficulty when you just sequence a genome and then you get uh, back an assembly that's maybe not as good as you're expecting? Um, and I'm also quite happy that some people don't have reference genomes here because um, I, I, I think everybody should be doing de novo assembly for um, as many things as possible. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start with this picture. Uh, it's a little cryptic. This is an assembly graph, or at least how I think of them in my mind. Um, essentially, an assembly graph is just a way of representing sequences and their relationships to each other. So typically, an assembly graph, each vertex or each node in the graph is some sequence, and we put an edge between two vertices or two sequences if they share some overlapping sequence. And the idea is that if edges represent sequences that could be merged together uh, to perform the assembly. Now you see that there's four different colors in this graph, gray, red, uh, this light green, and blue. And all of these are trying to de depict different structures that appear in assembly graphs. Um, I'm going to leave it at that right now, but I'm going to be returning to this picture later on and describing the different structures that form an assembly graph and what that actually tells us about the genomes that we're working with. So if you read assembly papers or you look at assembly software, you'll hear about two different types of assembly graphs. Um, there's the extremely popular De Bruyne graph model of assembly. This is where you take each sequence read break it into a set of subsequences that we term k-mers, and then construct a, a graph of these k-mer sequences. Um, this is by far the most popular way of performing assembly on next generation sequencing data, because these graphs where we're just breaking the reads into k-mers and finding k minus one uh, overlaps between them is extremely fast to construct. We can do this construction of the graph in linear time, um, so it scales extremely well for large volumes of data. Um, in opposition to that, we have string graphs or overlap-based uh, methods of assembly where each vertex in the graph is a sequencing read and we link vertices with an edge if they share an overlap. Um, and this is a very rich representation of the sequencing data. It's sort of the uh, as much information as, as you can possibly represent in the assembly graph, but the drawback is um, these graphs are very heavy to construct. In early approaches to assembly, you'd have to take all pairs of reads, compare them to each other, and this was extremely slow, so these string graph or overlap-based methods of assembly uh, didn't work very well for Illumina data. This is now changing, and there's been a lot of work on fast construction of these type of graphs. Um, I put one reference here where I, I published a paper at ISMB in Bioinformatics 2010 that allowed these graphs to be constructed very quickly um, if you restrict it to just exact matches between the reads. Um, this form of assembly uh, is the basis of the SJ Assembler, which is one of the primary software uh, programs that I work on. So I'm going to use the string graph um, to go into more detail about how these assembly graphs are constructed. So we start with just a single sequencing read and we add that read to, as a vertex in the graph. Then as we add a second read, we now add a second vertex to the graph and since this read, read 2, overlaps the previous read, read 1, we add an edge between them. 
And we've labeled the edge here TAC, which is the portion of read 2 uh, that read 1 does not contain. And the idea here is that if we added this string TAC to read 1, we would get a string that contains both read 1 and read 2. So we'd have an assembly, which is a super string of both of these two vertices. We can extend this idea to more and more collections of reads. Um, so if we add a third read here, we add a third vertex to the graph, we add two more edges to the graph. If we add a fourth read here, um, it overlaps all the previous reads, so we add more and more edges to the graph. All of them are labeled by these overhanging stretches sequence. Now the fundamental property of assembly that I want to get across here is that uh, walks through these assembly graphs give us reconstructions of the genome. So if we find a walk that starts at V1, goes to V2, V3, V4, and we collect all the sequences along these labeled edges, we reconstruct the sequence of this genome for this toy example. So the idea is that assembly just boils down to making these gr large graphs and then finding walks through the graph that reconstruct the sequence of your genome. So that's where most of the work to assembly goes, is just building these graphs and, and trying to find walks. But there's a lot of steps to an assembler. Um, when we have real data, it often doesn't behave in ways that we expect or we want. So we have to perform a lot of different cleaning steps to clean up the data before assembly. Uh, and now this is going into the more practical aspects and may talk about what um, so my, my picture of a generic assembly pipeline looks like, where we start from raw read data up here, and then it goes down the pipeline this way, um, and we might perform some read trimming or filtering to get rid of low quality reads. We might then perform error correction, build the assembly graph, clean it up a little, construct contigs from the graph, and then scaffold them together and perform gap filling. And I'm going to go through each one of these steps uh, in, in detail now. Yeah. So what we usually do, um, and I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the, the contig assembly step in more detail, but, but right now, what we usually do is we only can find play, paths through the graph that are unambiguous. So we don't want to follow branches in the graph because this might be traversing through some repetitive structure that we don't know um, what the exact order is. So typically we just find these simple paths in the graph where there, each vertex has one edge going out and one edge going in. And it's almost universal that most assemblers will do this, at least as a first step, is just assemble all the, the simple things that can be unambiguously merged. Um, you might take more, if you have paired end data, you might try to do some more sophisticated resolution. But, but for this purpose, I think it, it, it's fair to say that they just find unambiguous parts of the graph. And, and you're right that there is no start and end. Um, you, just, you, you just sample each vertex and then assemble locally from there. Yeah, please ask questions as we go. Um, I don't want to stand here like I'm just talking for 50 minutes. Okay, um, so the, really the first step is, is to uh, do read based, or read trimming and read filtering. Um, so often, if you've seen the, C, the error profile of Illumina data, it drops towards the end of the read. Um, if your sequence data is very bad, you might have very low quality uh, bases at the end of the read, and you might want to just trim them back a little to uh, the higher quality sections. A second problem that trimming can solve is if you have uh, adapters in your data, so if you've sequenced um, longer than what your fragment length is, you can go right into the Illumin adapters, and um, your sequences will be chimeric, where you have your actual DNA that you're interested in, and then whatever uh, the Illumina adapters are, and you always want to trim these off. Uh, and this example down here is an IGV screenshot of some data that I had that had uh, quite bad adapter contamination, and you see all of these colored bars here uh, were adapters that were attached to my read. And if I tried to assemble this without getting rid of the adapters, the assembly would have completely failed, just because all of these adapter sequences would go to one branch in a graph, uh, 
and we just have tons of, uh, of what looks like repeats in the graph that couldn't be resolved. So I just ran a simple trimmer on this data and then got quite a good assembly out of it. So some trimming software that I like, um, there's a program called Kraken, which was uh, developed at the EBI. So this will actually infer what the sequence of your adapters are and automatically remove them. Uh, Trimomatic is a very popular um, uh, quality-based trimmer where it, will, where it will look at quality scores and then get rid of bases that are uh, much lower quality than expected. Um, some assemblers will actually have a trimmer or quality-based trimmer built in, and some of them you need to use uh, one of these standalone trimmers um, that you can get online. So as an alternative to, to quality-based trimming, um, or in addition to, you can perform error correction. So this is the Illumina sequencing error profile that I, I, I just mentioned um, for six different data sets. So as you see here, for each of the data sets, um, at, at the first base, so here we're looking at just the first base to the last base and the average error rate over um, a, a sample of a million reads. At the first base, the error rate's quite low, but for all the data sets, it goes up towards the end of the read. Um, and if we leave this data un uncorrected, it's going to cause problems in the graph. It's going to cause a lot of uh, new branches in the graph because all sequencing errors create essentially new sequence um, that contributes new structures to the graph. Now, we want to get rid of as much of this as possible. Um, so what we can do is we can perform error correction. So an error correction is just taking our sequencing reads and trying to infer the positions in the read that are wrong and setting them to the right bases. Uh, so in this example here, I've marked this C uh, in red color to indicate that it's a sequencing error. And um, I'm going to explain Kamer based error correction. So here we just look at the abundance of each Kamer and try to infer which Kamers in the read are errors or not. So Kamer, again, is just a subsequence of some fixed length. Here I think it's 20. So if we look at every 20 base uh, stretch in the read starting from the beginning, so say this first 20 bases, and count how many times it appears across your entire read set, the cameras that are error-free are going to be seen many times. We always sequence genomes to about 40 or 50x when we're trying to assemble them, so we expect a lot of redundancy in the data set. So uh, error-free cameras are in high abundance, but then when we get to the cameras that contain the sequencing error, like this camer over here, because they generate a new sequence that's, not, it's, that's unlikely to be seen elsewhere in the data set, the abundance is quite low. So error-free cameras have high abundance, cameras with errors have low abundance. And typically they're only seen a single time. It'll create a unique camer that's unique to this read and not seen anywhere else, just because sequencing errors are quite rare. Now we can use this observation to perform error correction. So this is a uh, camer count profile that looks at a single read. So if we start from the leftmost base, the first base of the read, and we count how many times that first camer has been seen, typically they're seen about 20 to 30 times, depending on your sequencing coverage. So if we move from the read from left to right, um, this fluctuates just due to sampling noise. And then we hit this position here around uh, the 60th camer in the read, and the count drops down to one. So the assembler would infer that there's an error at this position because it's expecting to see the next camer about 20, 25 times, but it only sees it once. So it would infer there's an error there, and it would search the other three possibilities to see if it could correct it. Um, and in this case, one of uh, the three po other possible bases successfully recovers the count profile, and it, and it matches what the rest of the read is. So it's just, so camera-based error correction is just looking for these low-frequency cameras and then trying alternatives to see if it can fix uh, the read. So there's a lot of different camera-based error correctors available. Uh, so a very popular one is Quake, uh, which was developed by David Kelly and Steven Salzberg's lab. Uh, in my assembler SGA, there's a camera-based error corrector, which is tuned to be very uh, memory efficient. Paul Medvedev wrote a 
program called Hammer, and uh, the very popular Soap De Novo Assembler also has a camera-based error corrector. Um, an alternative method of performing error correction is by finding overlaps between the whole sequencing reads and then calling a new consensus to sequence. So just looking at how consistent the base calls are for a group of reads that share the same sequence and then setting um, the incorrect bases to whatever the most prevalent base is for that position. So a good example of this method of error correction is in the all paths assembler which was developed uh, by the Broad Institute and David Jaffe's group. It's an extremely good error corrector. It can find a lot of errors, even more errors than the Kamer-based uh, correctors, but it's much, much slower. Finding overlaps between all these sequencing reads um, is computationally very demanding, so overlap-based correction tends to be about an order of magnitude slower than Kamer-based correction. Okay, next we would uh, then take our, our cleaned up data and then put it into an assembly graph. Um, so I alluded to, to De Bruyne graphs before, and now I'll take you through the construction of De Bruyne graph in more detail. Um, so again, this is a Kamer based model where we want to break up the reads into short subsequences and construct a graph of those subsequences. So here, this is the De Bruyne graph with k equals 4 of this collection of reads, these five six base pair reads. So we take every former in each read, so C, C, G, T, and we put that as a vertex in the graph. Then we take the next one, C, G, T, T, put that as a vertex. And we just do that, sliding this camera window across every read and constructing a vertex for every one of those cameras. Now this, this vertex in red is special because it can, it's present in multiple reads with different uh, next bases. It represents a branch in the assembly graph. Um, so there's CGTT followed by an A in this read here, and CGTT followed by a C in this read, and that's this branch here. So that causes a branch in the graph, and the assembler might look at this and think it's ambiguous, and you wouldn't be able to resolve what the true sequence is. Now there's a path that goes down here, back around, and up here, but you could also have, just as likely, an assembly that goes down here, goes back through this loop, and then again, up here. So the fact that this came with branches makes it uh, that we can't figure out what the true assembly is for this sequence. So, in, when I started an assembly in 2007, um, De Bruyne graph assembly was becoming popular. Um, the theory was worked out in about 2001 by Pavel Pesner, but De Bruyne assembly didn't really become um, a popular method of, of of applying it to real data until NGS SM, uh, data turned up and we had to deal with these huge volumes of data. And I'm just going to spend a few slides on um, fairly technical material about uh, what my research involves and how we can efficiently encode these uh, assembly graphs. So the first next generation uh, sequencing assemblers that, that used a Bruin assembly, these Kamer based methods, they typically used pointer-based graphs. So for every Kamer, you would have uh, an 8-byte pointer. And if you've ever programmed in C or C++, then you know um, that this is how you, you, you represent memory locations in the program. And all of these assemblers are written in these sort of low-level languages. But essentially, you take 8 bytes for every vertex and 8 bytes for every edge in the graph. And this turned out that you required a few hundred bits per Kamer to store uh, this graph in memory. And that's why assembly became such a notorious um, memory hog when you're performing assembly for very large data sets. If you want to do a human assembly where the graph has something like 10 billion vertices, you'd require hundreds to even thousands of gigabytes of memory. So this is why everyone will rep uh, recommend that you get the largest memory server you can when performing de novo assembly. Um, but this isn't, this isn't required. We can do much better than a few hundred bits of memory per Kamer. Um, and it starts with a very simple observation. Because we've had, uh, we're constructing this graph that is, consists of just Kamers, 
each vertex in the graph could have at most four neighboring vertices. There can be one with an A in the last position, one with a C in the last position, one with a G, and one with a T. So because there's such a restricted neighbor set, we don't need to store um, each vertex, each edge in the graph using an 8-byte pointer. In fact, we can get rid of the edges uh, entirely and just make them implicit in the graph. And this is what an assembler that I wrote um, in 2007 when I was at the Genome Sciences Center uh, in Vancouver called the BIS. Um, this is what it does. Instead of storing, explicitly storing the edges of the graph, what I do is I just take a, a large hash table, put every single kamer that's in the sequencing collection into a hash table, and when I want to look up the edges of a particular vertex to see what the neighbors are, I just query the, the hash table for the four possible neighbors. So if I'm trying to find the edges of CGTT, I would look to see if GTTC is in the hash table, and I'd look to see if GTT a is in the hash table. And if it is, I'd say, okay, I know that there's these two neighbors of this uh, vertex. And this allows us to represent the assembly graph in much, much smaller amounts of memory. We can shrink the memory by about an order of magnitude from about 1,000 gigabytes of memory to something like 100 gigabytes of memory. Um, and this idea of making the assembly graph implicit by just storing a set of kamers has become um, the jumping off point for developing even more efficient me uh, methods of representing assembly graphs. So two computer scientists in Australia, Thomas Conway and Andrew Bromage, um, they took an approach called sparse bit vectors for representing this Kamer set. So they take this set of Kamers here, um, construct a bit vector of size 4 to the k. Here k is 4, so 4 to the k is 256. And then they would set a bit in this bit vector for every k that's present in the, the set. And this allowed them to then compress this sparse bit vector and get an extremely compact representation of uh, the Kamer set, which is about 28 bits per Kamer. So now we've gone from hundreds of bits per Kamer down to about 28 bits per Kamer. Uh, and this was really a, a large theoretical breakthrough in representing the assembly graphs. Sure. Yeah. Can you just a little bit how that sure. So um, we can write each kamer as a number from 0 to 4 to the k by just saying a is uh, 0, 0, c is 0, 1, g is 1, 0, t is 1, 1. And then we just do that concatenating this bit string, and that gives this number from 0 to 4 to the k. And we set that numerical representation of the kamer as the bit in this bit vector. Um, so it's never going to be larger than 256, or rather 255. So each letter is like two squares? Um, so uh, you could actually think of it that way. Yeah, I, I, I think of it, I just wrote, drew this in 2D because um, it's much more compact to, to draw on a slide. But you can just think of it as each one of these kamers is one of these, these filled in boxes. Um, so we have nine kamers here, so we have nine bits set in this bit vector. And then what they do is just compress this down. It compresses. It, it turns out that it's very sparsely encoded because we don't actually use k of 4 in real assembly. We usually use k of 60. Um, so it's much longer k-mers. So 4 to the k is an extremely large number that we couldn't represent in memory. Um, but we have this very sparse bit vector that we can compress down. But each one of these k-mers corresponds to one of these black boxes here. Is that good? Now, um, a method of representing these graphs that's even more recent and it's gaining a lot of popularity is using a Bloom filter. Um, so in a Bloom filter, again, we, we take uh, a bit vector and we set bits corresponding to each kamer. But now we don't just calculate the numeric index of each kamer. What we do is we apply multiple hash functions to the kamer sequence. So in this case, three hash functions. Um, and then for whatever value the hash functions return, we set the corresponding bits in this bit vector. So each kamer gets hashed three times, we set three bits, 
out of however large that our, our bit vector is. Now, when we want to check whether our k-mer is present in the Bloom filter, we run the same three hash functions on it, and we check whether those three bits have been set. If they are set, we have uh, we know that the k-mer is probably in our bit vector. Now, Bloom filters have uh, this nice pro property that if you've added your k-mer into the Bloom filter, it's always going to return that it's there. But you can have false positives. If you didn't add the k-mer to the Bloom filter, it might return that it, it is in the Bloom filter. Um, and now, the Titus Brown's group is the one that are uh, developing this method of representing De Bruyne graphs. And they've shown that you can have, um, you can tolerate a certain false positive rate within your Bloom filter. You can have 5% false positive rates, and it doesn't affect how well you can assemble the sequence. Um, and within the Bloom filter, you have this trade off between your bit vector size, which is the memory usage of your assembler, and how often you get false positives. So as long as you keep your false positive rate under a certain percentage, you can perform assembly just fine. And this allows an extremely compact representation of the graph, which is about 10 bits. So um, this slide just summarizes the different ways that we can represent these graphs, um, starting from the early methods, what were pointer-based, which took hundreds of bits per kamer, down to uh, somewhat more exotic data structures like the FM index and uh, this data structure called DBGFM um, that I worked on last year, which allows you to, to represent the assembly graph in about four bits per camera. Um, and this progression of, uh, of improvements in, in the memory usage of assembly graphs has been one of the driving forces that allow us to do assembly as a fairly routine uh, part of bioinformatics. Okay, so that's one of the most technical part of the talk. I'm going to now return back to the practical uh, aspects. So once we've constructed this graph, we want to clean it up a little. So here's another schematic of an assembly graph. Uh, it looks like a bit of a mess. We have um, branches hanging off here. We've got these small little structures here. We've got edges crossing. And we want to try to uh, make this assembly graph more manageable. And the first thing that we do is something called tip removal. Um, so any sequencing errors that are, remain after error correction will cr cause these branches in the graph where they just... Uh, diverge a little and cause these short little what we call tips. So all of these um, these vertices here correspond to sequencing errors that are colored in red. And what the assembler will do is just look for these short little branches and then start trimming them back towards the main part of the graph. So in the first pass it would identify all these red nodes um, and then it would go back towards the main part of the graph until it found it and then got, get rid of all of those tips. So that's just a way of cleaning more sequencing errors from your assembly graph. Um, and you end up with a much more simple structure that has fewer branches which are going to stop uh, the assembly when we get to the stage of building contigs. Uh, next we'd want to remove what are called bubbles. So if the genome that you've sequenced is diploid, any SNPs in the genome cause the diverging structure in the graph where um, we have a branch where one branch covers one allele and the other branch covers the other allele. So if we have a heterozygous SNP, this might be the A allele, this might be the C allele. And since we want linear structures in the graph, we try to get rid of these. So the assembler will just run a simple algorithm to find these bubbles um, where we start at each branch point and then we see if they rejoin a short distance later. So we run the algorithm, starting all these blue nodes, and then traversing until we find these, um, the places where these bubbles rejoin. So, Gary, yeah. so you're talking about short mean, so do you, so you do small end downs up to uh, or? Um, typically these would be indels of, yeah, probably about 100, up to 100. Up to up to 100. Most of the bubbles you remove will be just SNPs um, and then short indels as well. Uh, usually the assembler will, will compare the sequence of this path to this path and as long as they're close enough it then collapses them down to a single representation of the allele. So if you had something that's very complex it might not 
actually remove it because it might look like a re two different copies of a repeat where it wants to try to keep that. Um, and now you can see that when we started with the graph, it was quite, quite complicated, but now we've ended up with something that's much simpler and much more manageable. Sorry, Ken. Uh, so the, when you're collapsing it, though, are yeah. you recording, the, let's say, the SNP? It depends on the assembler. Some of them just throw out the second half of the bubble, the second allele. Some of them will write um, the, di the divergent structure into a FASTA file that you can look at after it's the assembly. And some of them will actually write in IUPAC ambiguity codes um, into the structure of the, the sequence. So it would represent like an AC as a Y or whatever the ambiguity code is. Yeah. And does it also do uh, some of them do phasing or try to keep phasing? Most of them won't. Um, usually the, the reads are so short, 100 bases, that you can't do a very good job of phasing. Yeah. Okay, and then finally we get to uh, the contig assembly part, and, and this goes back to the question that we had earlier in um, how the assemblers actually generate in contigs from this. It's just looking for all of these, these parts of the graph that are branch free. So we're looking, we'd, we'd find a contig here, we'd find a contig here, and so on. So we just start merging them together into longer and longer sequences until we end up with our final contig set. And this is just one contig um, for all of the, what we call, unambiguous paths in the graph. Um, so the result is just a collection of contig sequences. Now, what are the lengths of these contigs? If you work with fairly simple genomes, if you're interested in uh, bacterias, then you can expect contigs from Illumina data to be around uh, 100,000 base pairs on average, or median contig length of around 100,000 base pairs. If you work with large eukaryotic genomes, um, like for instance the human genome, you typically typically get about 10 to 15,000 base pair contigs um, from Illumina data. Now something I haven't talked about yet is um, newer sequencing technology like PacBio. If you do PacBio sequencing on bacterial genomes, you can, it's quite likely that you get a, um, a single contig that represents the entire genome. So they've, the PAC biosequencing bacteria has become a very effective way of getting finished genomes uh, for these relatively simple organisms. But the cost is so high that for large eukaryotic genomes, it's still quite prohibitive to do uh, PAC biosequencing. I'm not going to talk about that in detail, but if anybody is interested in that, I, I can, I'm happy to, to talk about it a little later. Okay, and then once we have contigs, we then want to try to link them together into larger structures. Um, so the, since the assembler stops at these branch points, um, we've sort of thrown away information. We don't know which repeats go together, and we, our assembly might stop at repeat boundaries, and we want to try to recover that as much as possible. And this is where we can start to bring in paired-end data. Um, so hopefully you had an introduction to paired-end data yesterday. Michelle is shaking her head, which is good. Um, and here, we, what we do is we take all these contigs that we just assembled, we map all of our read pairs back to our contigs, and we see where the, the pairs map. So for contigs where both ends of the pair map, great, we have this arc here, but the ends of contigs, uh, only one end of the pair might map. And what we can do is look at... Um, where the, the one end of the pair maps and where the other end of the pair maps. So here we have all the, this group of red pairs here that are joined this way. And we might think that this contig is followed by this contig in the genome. And we can just keep running this logic for all of the different groups of read pairs and link them all together. We, we then build uh, what we call a scaffold graph where we put arcs between contigs that we think are ordered um, in on uh, or neighboring on the genome. So uh, when we do this, we can take our paired end insert size that we know from the data and try to infer the distance between the contigs um, and then put in uh, ends in the gap between uh, pairs of contigs. And that's what we call scaffolds. Um, 
And as a final step, which most assemblers will, will perform, is we try to fill in the gaps of these scaffolds. So we have these runs of ends, which are the unknown bases that separate our contents and our scaffold. And the assemblers will try to perform a localized assembly of what are typically the repetitive sequence that are in between the contents. So these are the, are the things that couldn't be resolved by the graph. But if you take a more aggressive localized approach, sometimes you can fill in these scaffold grab, uh, gaps and get a more contiguous assembly. Uh, examples of programs, so in SGA there's a program called Gap Fill. Soap De Novo has uh, a gap closer module as well. And you can also uh, fill in gaps with other technologies. So if you've performed some PAC biosequencing for your large genome that wasn't enough to assemble it completely, you can try to see if the PAC bio data resolves these repetitive sequences that are in between contigs. Okay. So uh, are there any questions about that uh, portion of the talk, which was the assembly pipelines? What about plants? Plants are hard. Um, <laughs> they're typically hard, yeah. Um, this is actually, that's a good lead into this part. So what I'm going to talk about now is the factors that make assembly difficult. Um, and what really prompted this work is... Um, a competition called the Assemblathon, or the Assemblathon 2, which was organized by UC Davis, and what they did is they took sequencing data from three large eukaryotic genomes, released it to the, to the community, all the people who are interested in developing assemblers. They said, assemble this. We then gave the, the results of the assemblies back to UC Davis, and they scored each assembly um, to see how well all the programs and different pipelines performed. Um, and this is a quote from Keith Bradnam, who is organizing this competition from the paper. We make a few broad uh, suggestions to someone performing a de novo assembly of a large eukaryotic genome. Don't trust the results of a single assembly. If possible, generate several assemblies um, with different parameters and different pipelines. And the reason that he said this is that the results for this assembly phone competition were highly variable. Some, assembly, some assemblers performed very well on some genomes, but not the others, and some genomes were much easier to assemble than the others. And it's very difficult to predict how well your assembly is going to turn out when you start with it. You don't know anything about your genome, you don't know about its repeat structure, you might not even know its GC content, and all of these factors uh, matter when choosing how you're going to assemble the genome. So last year I worked on a program that tries to measure these different ways of, um, uh, these different things that, that make assembly difficult. So I've just made a list here. So if your genome's highly repetitive um, or highly heterozygous, which is why plants are difficult to assemble, um, it causes problems. So if you remember back to when I was talking about assembly graphs, repeats cause these branches in the graph that, that stop the contig building process. Heterozygosity causes these bubbles in the graph that make it difficult for the assembler to resolve um, what the allelic structure is. Um, more factors that make assembly difficult, if, the, if you've sequenced to low coverage, um, then you get a lot of coverage breaks in your graph where you just didn't sample enough sequences to uh, have a complete graph. If your sequencing is biased towards high or low GC content, then again, that causes uh, breaks in the graph due to coverage. If your data has high error rate, it causes more branches in graphs. If you have chimeric reads, if you have a lot of adapters in your sequence, then again, it causes problems in the graph, and so on. And all of these things are, I think, not really... Um, taking into account when designing how you're going to do your assembly. And, it, and for the user of a de novo assembler, they don't think about these things early in the process when they're designing their assembly strategy. Um, so I've been working on ways of making it easier to measure uh, whether these all of these factors are going to affect a given assembly. Um, now we do this by returning to the structure of the assembly graph again. And I've already talked about how errors form in the graph. They form these little branches here that we call tips. I've talked about how SNPs and indels form these bubbles in the graph. But I haven't talked about how repeats form 
um, a branches and graph, but it's a fairly natural idea in that if you have some repetitive structure, the graph will have a branch between the different copies of the repeat and some structure that you can't resolve. So I'm just depicting this here. And this program that I'm developing, which is called uh, pre-QC, tries to learn the structure of the graph and measure how often does the graph branch due to repeats, how often does the graph branch due to SNPs and indels, how often does it branch due to errors, and what can it, we tell about the genome um, by just looking at the assembly graph. So it do, does this by calculating Kamer coverage. I've talked about this before uh, when we're talking about error correction. Most Kamers in the graph will be seen many times. If we've sequenced to 50x, on average, we might see Kamers 40 times, 41 times. And we can use this as, uh, to perform inference over the graph by just looking at how many times each Kamer has been uh, represented. So the most, the most basic output is just plotting a histogram of these Kamer counts. Um, this is a histogram of Kamer counts for a human genome. We see that it's roughly normal uh, in distribution with a mean of, um, I think, around 28. And, but we see a, a few different peaks here. We see there's a, this sharp peak here. So all of these Kamers, which is about 6% of the Kamers, have been seen a single time. So these are the Kamers that had sequencing errors, as I mentioned before during the error correction point. Um, these Kamers that have been seen a single time are probably just the Kamers that have been generated by a uh, sequencing error occurring at some position. And then we see a little feature here where there's a bump at this uh, location here, which is about half of the main coverage. So these are Kamers that cover heterozygous SNPs. Now in the human genome, this isn't so pronounced. It's just a little bump here that's barely perceptible. You might even say it's noise. If we look at a more difficult genome, like the oyster genome, we see uh, a much more awful count distribution. Here we have two very well-defined peaks. Um, one here for Kamers that are present in both parental chromosomes, and one here that are uh, present on only one parental chromosome. These are the heterozygous Kamers. Now, this corresponds to um, a SNP every about 80 bases in this genome. And this is much, much too heterozygous to assemble using conventional methods that just use uh, Illumina sequencing. So this data came from a paper by the BGI where they sequenced the oyster, tried to assemble it, um, using just normal whole genome shotgun techniques and failed and ended up sequencing phosmids to assemble the genome just because the heterozygosity was so high. And we can apply this to a lot of different um, a lot of different genomes and try to infer how often these branches um, occur. So we built a statistical model of uh, the structures in the assembly graph, and I'll just briefly go through this because uh, I'm starting to run out of time. But essentially what we do is we, we count the number of Kamer occurrences on each half of the branch. So here we have a branch where this node CX is seen 33 times, this side is seen 30 times, this side is seen 2 times. Because this side of the branch is so rare when compared to this side of the branch, we would probably say that this is just a sequencing error and we could get rid of that half of the branch. If the coverage between the two halves of the branch is balanced, so if you have half the Kamers on this side of the branch, half the Kamers on this side of the branch, we would probably say that this is a SNP or an indel, uh, that's a heterozygote in the genome. If the coverage um, of the branch is much higher, here, so 45 plus 24 is much higher than the incoming side of the branch, we'd probably say that this is a repeat structure here. And we can run this over every branch in the graph and try to estimate how often these uh, structures in the graph appear due to SNPs and indels uh, and how often they occur due to repeats. So here's just six different genomes. So this is in yellow is the oyster genome. This is an estimate of how often the graph branch is due to SNPs and indels. And we see that it's very often for the oyster genome. Um, this is a, a parakeet from the assemblophone competition. It's also highly heterozygous and branches quite often. Down here in light blue is the human genome, which doesn't have that many SNPs. Um, 
it's only about one in a thousand bases, so the branch rate is about um, one in a thousand. So we've correctly estimated the SNP rate in the human genome here. Down here in dark blue is um, a yeast genome which is not diploid, um, and it, it is reflecting the fact that the graph branches very infrequently with these bubble-like structures. So you can run this program on your raw data and estimate how heterozygous your genome is without knowing anything about it before starting the assembly. And this helps you to understand um, what the difficulty is going to be when, when you actually run your assembly. Would you choose a different assembler based on that? Yes, you probably would. You have two strategies. You can either go, say you wanted to see assemble this bird genome, um, which is fairly heterozygous, but maybe not uh, cripplingly so. You might take an assembler that's designed for high, highly heterozygous genomes. Your second option is to parameterize the assembly. All, most assemblers have a lot of tuning knobs that you can change how they work, and you might say, okay, well, try harder to remove these bubbles from the graph, or, or try to resolve heterozygosity more. Yeah? So for the yeast, the haploid genome there, is that an error rate? Yes, exactly. That's the error rate. So we misidentify bubbles in the graph at a rate of about um, 1 in 40,000 bases. Uh, so if you look at the frequency of repeat branches, which we also estimate, here it tells a slightly different story. Um, as we expect, the human genome is highly repetitive, um, which is littered with transposons, and that's reflected in this repeat branch plot. Um, and the rate of branches with the human genome is, is the highest um, here. Similar rate of repeat branches is the oyster genome. So the oyster genome is only a fifth of the size of the human genome, but it's comparably repetitive. Um, and as we go down, the assem the, these species become easier and easier to assemble. So here is the, um, in red is the assemblathon snake, in green is the assemblathon fish, and again the bird is in uh, purple. And then the small yeast has a very infrequent branches due to repeats because it's only 12 megabases with a fairly simple genome. Now, um, what I didn't explain earlier is that these plots are per Kamer value. So if you remember, the K is the size of the um, subsequences that we use to, to um, construct the assembly graph. And as we increase K, we use longer and longer Kamers, the graph becomes less and less repetitive. So strategy is that when you are sequencing difficult genomes, you want to use a more stringent assembly parameters, which in this case means uh, larger K. But of course, to support a much larger K, you need to have higher coverage sequencing. So if you have very uh, large genomes, you might want to spend an extra money and sequence twice as much, and then use more stringent assembly parameters out here. Sure. Yeah. So these repetitive uh, regions, what do they look like once the assembler gets to the output? Um, the assembler won't annotate repeats for you. It would just look like any other sequence. Um, what you can do is then map your reads back to the assembly and, and look at them to see if there's big pileups of reads or a lot of divergence, a lot of mismatches in these regions. But the assembler typically won't, um, won't annotate repeats. So if I open up this assembly in my IGB, where the assembly They won't assemble at all. The centromeres are too repetitive, and, and the telomeres won't. Uh, they'll just be, um, they would, so the assemblers, most assemblers will give you back the complete graph, and all of the centromeric sequence would just be single Kamer vertices. So they, they would just, because they branch so much, it just stops immediately. So you get very short, fragmented pieces of the assembly. Is there another question? Yeah. So Higher coverage, it's good because you have many k repeats. Um, when you have higher coverage, you can use a longer k -mer, and that is um, that has less branching in the graph. Uh, so how about when you have longer reads? Yeah. Does, doesn't that also allow you to have uh, longer k -mers? Yes, that's right. Yeah. 
your camera coverage, because you break up a read um, into camers, the number of camers in each read is linear in the, in, the, in the length of the read. So if you have longer reads, you get more camers out. So you can use correspondingly higher K. So if you have 100 base pair reads, we typically don't go over K of about 60 to 70. But if you had 250 base pair reads, you might use K up to 100 or 120. Uh, but then you could start arg arguing whether you should use an overlap-based assembler. Um, but that's sort of a different argument. So what, when you look for the repeated cameras, do you look just in one read or across all the reads? It's across all reads, yeah. Yeah, so this program is just measuring the structure. It's like you can think about it as building the full assembly graph and then trying to classify each branch in the graph into one of these three categories, error, repeat, or heterozygote. Larger cameras doesn't make everything much slower. Um, it uses more memory. Um, typically, it's. I would say it doesn't have a large effect on the runtime, because there's less of these repeats to try to resolve in the graph, so it makes the assembler's job easier. So I'd say that it. If anything, you should have equal runtime or slightly faster with large K. Okay, and also this program uh, will predict the genome size for you. So uh, this is just the output of the program. This laser pointer is dead. Um, so here the human genome is predicted to be about three gigabases, which is more or less correct. And then for these assemblathon species, um, they're within about 10%. So you can predict what your genome size is directly from your raw sequencing reads without, um, without actually performing the assembly. So the program will also estimate the quality um, of your data. So it will look at the quality scores and plot the mean quality score by position. So this roughly represents the error rate of your data. Um, so the fish data is the lowest quality data set here, um, and the snake data, which was sequenced by Illumina itself, was the highest quality data set uh, in the assemblathon. We can also measure the error rate by just uh, looking at overlapping reads. So the program will take a read, find all of uh, the reads that share common sequences with it, and then calculate a consensus at each position. And here we see that most reads show an a, uh, a G here, and um, this read shows a C, so we infer there's an error here, we infer an error here, and we can calculate um, this per position error rate plot that I showed earlier. This is handy for choosing whether you want to perform this quality-based trimming that I mentioned uh, earlier. So for this data where the error rate becomes very high towards the end, um, this is the assemblathon bird data. You might want to trim it back to about 120 bases where the error rate's only about 1.5% rather than using the full length of the data, which becomes quite noisy at the end. So this, again, helps you guide how you're going to do your assembly. Um, it also lo lets you look at more complicated metrics like whether you have uh, a sequencing bias towards particular GC content. So this is a plot of coverage versus GC content for the assemblathon fish data. Um, this looks quite good. Um, the coverage doesn't look very biased. If we look at a different data set like the yeast, we see that there's you could draw this line through here, which indicates that um, higher GC regions in this data set are sequencing worse than um, lower GC regions. So we have this bias toward lower GC sequence here. And typically, we don't want to see this. We'd, we'd like coverage to be uh, relatively uniform across the entire genome, independent of GC content. If we look at the oyster data, um, we see something quite interesting. Here, there are two blobs in this plot. Uh, this lower blob is all of the heterozygous camers that I mentioned because this genome has such a high density of SNPs. In the upper blob is all the homozygous camers, the ones that were present on both parental chromosomes. So again, these plots are giving us information about what the structure of this genome is and how difficult the assembly is going to be.
Um, the program will also estimate the fragment size distribution for your library. So if you've done paired end sequencing and your lab told you that it was um, on average of 400 base pair fragment, you can run this program and check whether this matches uh, expectation. So just picking out one example here, here's the snake data in red. We see that the uh, average fragment size is about 375 bases with this distribution here. Um, in the Oyster data, there's three peaks because there's three different sequencing libraries um, for this genome. And finally, the program will actually perform a simulated assembly for you um, across a range of K, so you can see, get some information about which k -mer you should use when you're actually performing your assembly. Um, so for most of the genomes, like take the yeast for an example, with low K, the assembly is not very good, but then with the intermediate K, we find a peak here, and then it drops back down to not being, being very good at high K. Now the reason for this is when you use a small k -mer, the graph is more repetitive because you have this not very stringent parameter, but for high k -mer, you haven't sequenced enough to have good coverage of the graph, so the graph breaks a lot due to drops in coverage, so you end up with this sort of Goldilocks principle where there's this camer that's just right in the middle. And what you can do is just um, visually inspect this plot, say, okay, I'm going to try all of these camers that look like it's going to give us the best assembly around here. And the other genomes all, all have the same sort of curve where low camers aren't very good, and then um, intermediate camers give me the best assembly, so for the assemblathon bird, you might pick something around K61, uh, which is a good starting point for the assembly. Interestingly, the snake data keeps going up and up because this genome is sequenced to extremely high coverage. I think it was about 100x, so we haven't actually used a camer that's big enough or long enough to uh, negatively affect the assembly. You could keep assembling out to a larger and larger camer and keep improving the assembly. Okay, so just a plug for um, this software. It's, it's quite easy to run and fast. It, you can run it on uh, less than 24 hours for a human genome. So everybody that comes to me to ask for assembly help, I tell them to run this program uh, first. There's a preprint on the archive, and it's now published in Bioinformatics, um, describing all of these methods and the source codes on GitHub. And it just consists of these three simple commands that you can run to um, generate this report and all these figures for your data. Uh, right, so I'll stop there just on time. And if you have any more questions, just feel free to email me. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss anything else. OK. Sorry, okay? again? Very recently, people have. Um, there's a good paper from the Broad Institute doing that, where they tried to take the um, when you sequence when you when you assemble human genome, you get a bunch of sequence that doesn't map to the reference. It's just novel sequence, and you don't know where it is. And they've tried to use population data to infer where that's placed on the reference genome. Um, but this is a fairly new idea, and people haven't really done it at large scale to try to resolve these, these structures in the graph, because you could think about using something like, like LD to, to try to infer um, what pieces of, of the genome go together. I would have known 